talk. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Water Institute Water Talk at the University of, of Waterloo. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm the Executive Director of the Water Institute, and I want to start by acknowledging that we're participating today from traditional territories of the First Peoples across the country. Here in the Waterloo region, I'm on the Haldeman Tract, land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River. And here you see a map of the land. The Haldeman Tract is within the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. As you can see from the map here, there is a discrepancy between what was promised and where the original inhabitants of this area live and what was ultimately given as part of the agreement. The reserve is on approximately 19,000 hectares, whereas the original size of the land was almost 400,000 hectares. I encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional land where you are. Before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping items. Please add your questions to the Q&A box uh, during the talk. You can do this at any time throughout the talk, and then I'll help the speaker at the end of the talk to get to your questions. Use the chat box for general comments and technical issues, please. And this webinar will, as always, be recorded and posted to the Water Institute's YouTube channel afterwards. So it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Taher Kahil. Dr. Taher Kahil is the group leader of the Water Security Research Group at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, or also IASA, called IASA, in Luxembourg, Austria. Dr. Kahil obtained his PhD in economics at the University of Zaragoza in Spain, where his dissertation included the development and use of a hydroeconomic model of Spanish basins and the application of cooperative game theory to water resources management. His research interests are in the areas of integrated biophysical economic modeling for basin scale water policy analysis, economics of water allocation and water quality, and evaluation of adaptation policy interventions at global, uh, to global changes in water and agriculture. At IASA, Dr. Cahill leads the development of the large-scale hydroeconomic modeling framework work ECHO. He has over 40 publications, and Dr. Tahil Cahill is a topic editor at the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, um, and associate editor for Frontiers in Water. And in his talk today, Tahir will focus on global water security under changing socioeconomic and climate conditions and give us insight in the work that goes on in Luxembourg and Austria in his group. Dr. Cahill, we're very happy to have you with us here today, and I'm happy to open the virtual floor for you. Thank you very much, Professor Brower. I'm going to share my presentation. So, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you today uh, to talk about global water security under changing socioeconomic and climate conditions. My name is Taher Kahil. I'm the group leader of the Water Security Research Group at the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA. So I want to start first by um, introducing my organization. So IASA was established in 1972 in Luxembourg, New Vienna and Austria. We have 23 uh, member countries from Africa, the Americas, Asia and Europe. Uh, IASA develops policy-oriented research into problems that are too complex to be solved by a single country or discipline, such as, such as climate change, energy, food and water security, population aging, and sustainable development. Uh, we have more than 350 uh, scientific staff, and we have hosted more than 2,000 young scientists uh, trained in our Young Scientist Summer Program. IASA is actively uh, participating in high-level uh, processes, including the IPCC and the UN SDGs. So in, uh, in IASA, we have six research programs and 18 uh, research groups. The group I'm leading uh, is the Water Security Research Group, which is part of the uh, program called Biodiversity and Natural Resources. The Water Security Research Group uh, has 30 staff members between full, part, and part-time and guests uh, from 11 different nationalities. The group develops interdisciplinary approach for water connecting different sectors and scales. 
Uh, we also develop and use global traditional hydrological models, including quantity and quality and hydroeconomic modeling. We develop future water scenarios and assess their implication on water resources. We engage with stakeholders for basin level planning and we perform capacity development activities. So um, in the water security research group at IASA, we have been working on developing different modeling tools. Um, one of them is the, the so-called community water model, which is a large scale high resolution hydrological model. But we also developed a hydroeconomic model a framework called ECHO. And we use uh, a model developed by the Wageningen University in the Netherlands uh, to model water quality. It's called the Marina model. So uh, our, our hydrological model called the community water model it's a, it's, a, it's a large scale model that can be used globally at 50 kilometer resolution, but also regionally at 10 kilometer resolution and locally at one kilometer resolution, as you can see here in a different uh, picture. The model runs uh, at uh, daily time uh, scale uh, resolution. It is open source uh, in Python. It uses globally freely available uh, data and it includes the major hydrological processes. I invite you uh, to visit our uh, model website to further, to get further detail about the model and also to check the, the publication of the model paper in, in the journal uh, Geoscientific Model Development. So recently to improve the representation of groundwater, uh, into the model, we, we started uh, coupling the model CWATM with uh, ModFlow 6, uh, which can be applied uh, for basins at resolution less than one kilometer. It is a, an example of uh, the couplet model simulation in the Bhima Basin in India, where we could show that um, the model produces good results compared to the, to the observed uh, water table fluctuation in, in, in that basin. The second component, modeling component in our group is the hydroeconomic model uh, called ECHO. Uh, it's an optimization model that uh, aims to identify the optimal combination of water management option to, uh, so to balance water supply and demand at some basin level. The model includes a node link network representation of basins, and it has been applied uh, both at the basin scale as well as at the, at the continental scale. Uh, the model paper has been published in the journal Water Resources Research. Currently, we are working on implementing a global, a global uh, version of the model. Now, uh, related to water security, half of our planet population are water insecure. Uh, with absent and, re and reliable water supply and sanitation, problems with food security and irrigation management, significant impact of unmitigated variabilities, including floods and droughts, and degraded water environment. Those challenges might evolve in the future. And we need to assess how they will evolve and what type of solution option we could implement to address those challenges. So I'm going to present two, two projects where we have been working on, on, those, on those issues. The first project is the, the water future and solution uh, project, uh, where we, uh, we try to look at different future water scenarios and assess the changes in water availability and demand at the global level and explore solution options for, uh, for the water related problems together with, with stakeholders. So the research question that we had in this project was what, what water related policy and practices can be implemented now that will be robust at improving human well being through water security across a wide range of possible future and associated uncertainties. And the first phase or the fast track 
uh, analysis we did in this project, the, the project produced a consistent and comprehensive projection of global possible water future, focusing on the near future and the 2050s. And we assessed that employing a multi-model uh, projection. So our, our approach was to look at, uh, to assess uh, water availability and demand today and in the future uh, under different scenarios, socioeconomic and climate scenarios, and then explore what type of solution could be implemented in order to balance supply and demand. So here is uh, the methodological framework that we followed in this project. It includes different component. Um, the first component is the, the external, external scenario and model inputs. And here we use five global circulation models to look at the changes in, in, in the climate variables into the future. Then we developed three future water scenarios using um, the SSP, the shared socioeconomic uh, global scenarios and so-called hydroeconomic classification, which I will explain in the, in the next slide. To come up with three future scenarios, a sustainability scenario, a middle of the road scenario and original refinery scenarios. Then the impact of those uh, scenarios on water resources uh, have been uh, simulated using three well-known global hydrological models, uh, the PCR GLOBE, GLOBE uh, model, the H08 and water gap model. The, the whole methodological framework involved interaction with uh, stakeholders. So the hydroeconomic classification is a methodology that we developed to classify countries into four different classes based on uh, two main criteria. The first one is the, which is, which is in the X axis of the figure. It's called the hydroclimatic complexity and it's composed of four different indicators. And the second criteria in the y-axis is the so-called economic institutional capacity, and which is represented here by uh, the GDP per capita indicators. So then what we did was to uh, develop the so-called water extended SSP scenario. So starting from the global SSP scenarios, uh, which provides uh, and narr narratives on how future socioeconomic condition will be changing. Those scenarios, they don't include uh, information on water uh, resources. So what we did, we extended those SSP storylines with critical dimension affecting water availability and use together with stakeholders. And the first step, in the second step, we have assess it quantita qualitatively and quantitatively those dimensions uh, based on this hydroeconomic classification system. So here is an example of how the assumptions for uh, technological and structural changes in the industrial and domestic sector have been um, um, defined. So depending on uh, which class, in which class a country is, different values for, for different parameters are assigned. So for example, here we can see that water use efficiency improvement over time in the domestic sector are different uh, for different countries that are in different hydroeconomic classes. So then we use those scenarios to basically simulate uh, the change on future water availability and demand using the three hydrological, global hydrological model. So the results were basically on the availability side, we look at how um, water, surface water resources availability will change in 2050 compared to 2010. Here is an example for one scenario, middle of the road scenario, where we could see that basically the region suffering currently from water scarcity will uh, will see a reduction of water resources availability by 2050. On the demand side, uh, 
our results shows that water demand is projected to further increase in the coming decades, driven by, by population and income growth. As you can see here, uh, total global total water demand will increase substantially by 2050 by more than 60%. Uh, agricultural demand is expected also to increase, but less in relative terms than domestic and industrial water demands. This means that intersectoral competition for water uh, will intensify into the future. And this will have implication on how to plan, manage, and allocate water resources in the future. So putting together water availability and demand, we calculated uh, the, the water scarcity index, uh, which, is the, which shows the imbalance between water supply and demand. And the results shows that water scarcity is expected to further exacerbate on average in the future, becoming a widespread problem in many regions of, around the world. Water scarcity, uh, as shown in a study by the World Bank, could reduce GDP growth rate in some regions by 6% by 2050 as a result of losses in agriculture, health, income, and property sending them into sustained negative growth. Water scarcity could also cause several environmental problems, such as reduction of environmental flow and degradation of water-dependent ecosystems, sustaining the livelihood of millions of peoples. Therefore, there is an urgent need to design and implement solutions to balance water supply and demand. So in this study, uh, we, as I, I showed initially, we use it basically a combination of five uh, global climate models, three uh, global hydrological models, and three water scenarios. This has this gave us forty five water scarcity projections. So, in this study, we wanted to look uh, not only at the average or median water scarcity but also to, to, to look at the uncertainty in water scarcity projection um, and the sources of uncertainty on those projection, whether it's, it's the hydrological models, it's the climate models or the scenarios. The next slide shows how average and uh, interquartile range is changing in different basins uh, in the world. And the results illustrate two main things. The first is that there is a complex uh, behavior of both the change in the median response and the change in the uncertainty. And then it shows the time evolution of the relative importance of different sources of uncertainty. So if we look here at the Yangtze, Yangtze Basin, there is little change in the overall uncertainty, but nearly a constant increase in water scarcity index across all quantiles. types surpassing the indicated threshold for severe water scarcity in higher quantile from 2030s onward. While in the Danube Basin, the median and lowest quantile do not show changes in water scarcity index, while the higher quantiles show increases, pointing toward an increased risk of experiencing severe water scarcity conditions. Of course, those results are a little bit difficult to to explain to, to policymakers. Therefore, uh, the next step was to uh, classify the countries into different, uh, what we call challenges area, based on a combination of median water scarcity and the uncertainty range. And for each challenge area, we have tried to identify in a qualitative way what type of policy or interventions are needed to deal with water scarcity. So for example, <clears throat> in, in, in the low challenges area, incremental improvement on, of, in water use efficiency might be, might be enough. However, for areas facing severe water scarcity and increasing uncertainty, transformational changes will be needed. Now, after looking at this, at the problem of water resources, availability and demand and scarcity at the global level. Now we wanted to look at 
those issues more in, in the basin at the basin level. So in this second in this second study, uh, we started doing modeling at the basin level in the, in the Zambezi basin as part of a project called Integrated Solution for Water, Energy, and Land. So the Zambezi Basin is one of the largest river basin in Africa, covering an area of 1.4 million square kilometer and home to around 40 million people. It is a transboundary basin spanning over eight countries and 13 sub-basins. There is an, a basin governance structure called the ZAMCOM. The basin has a growing population and economy and many development challenges and high climate variability. There is a high potential and interest in agriculture and hydropower development, and there are valuable environmental ecosystems. Here is some of the some indicators showing the future socioeconomic development in the Zambezi. So for instance, you can see here that population is expected to grow substantially in the future. Also the GDP per capita. There are plans to invest heavily in hydropower and in irrigation. So the objective of this study was to look on what would be the implication of those future socioeconomic development on water resources in the basin. So to do that, uh, we developed an integrated, what we call a nexus integrated modeling framework, where we combine it uh, different mo sectoral models, uh, including hydrological modeling with uh, the seawater model, land use model, including globiome and epic model, the eco model, hydroeconomic model, and the water quality model marina to simulate various future scenarios of water management, energy and agriculture investment, climate and socioeconomic changes. And then we, um, through those model simulation, we, we could look at different nexus indicators, including water withdrawal by sector and source, nutrient loading, hydropower production, and food security indicators. We also use it something called the scenario tool uh, to look at the basin future and co-develop transformation pathways with, with stakeholders. So three scenarios uh, have been uh, co-created uh, in this study. Uh, that's a business as usual scenario, an economy oriented scenario and environment oriented scenario. There is different assumption on energy, agriculture, water, and trade. Here, I want to focus only on water. So in the business as usual scenario, uh, we want to um, continue with um, the current use of surface water, low level of water uh, access and sanitation, and no consideration of environmental flow constraint. In the economy-oriented scenario, uh, we tried to optimize the use of all water uh, sources. We allowed interbasin transfer and uh, new storage uh, development. We promoted efficiency and we implemented a medium level of water access and sanitation and no environmental flow constraints. While in the environment, or we could call it sustainable development scenario, uh, we also look at that the possibility to optimize all water sources, a high level of water access and sanitation, and a prioritization to environmental flows. So the results of the, of the simulation of different scenarios showed that uh, the, the Zambezi Basin will, will benefit quite a lot in the future from those uh, scenarios. So economic benefits in the basin will more than double in the three scenarios. Irrigated agriculture and hydropower production will also increase uh, considerably, and food availability will increase the basin, and the share of population at risk of hunger will decrease. In terms of the impact on, on water and water demand, uh, water use in the Zambezi currently account for um, amount currently to 17 uh, cubic kilometer per year. Evaporation from reservoirs represent uh, is the major water use, amounting to 12 cubic kilometer. 
In other economic sectors, they use only four cubic kilometer per year. So based on these different scenarios, um, our results show that water use is projected to increase considerably by 2050, like almost um, more than doubling. Um, most increases are originating from irrigation and domestic water use. And as you can see here at the basin level, uh, water supply, uh, so the available resources at the basin level, this 105 cubic kilometer of water could easily cover the increase in demand. However, when we start to look at, at the sub-basin level, we, we found that despite the abundance of our own water resources at, at, at the basin level, there will be uh, local water scarcity in, in, in certain sub-basins uh, of the Zambezi Basin. In addition, we found that um, some of the scenarios will result in negative environmental impacts in the absence of environmental policy. This includes the reduction of river flow, increase of greenhouse gas emission, and increase of nutrient loading uh, to sea. So the main research findings of this study are uh, the future development in the Zambezi are expected to increase food and energy production and related benefits. That includes food security, trade surplus, financial gains over the coming years. These developments are projected to considerably increase water use in the Zambezi, exacerbating local water stress problems in the most populated sub-basin of the middle and lower sections. Future development of hydropower and irrigation could create negative environmental impacts and the absence of environmental protection policy. An important result we, we found in this study that the sustainable development of the Zambezi Basin was, not, was found not to compromise economic benefits. It could rather increase social and environmental benefits. Groundwater resources are expected to play an important role in the future to address increasing climate variability and also as a way to reallocate surface water from irrigation to hydropower and the environment. Lastly, different solution options could be implemented to smooth the economic impact of environmental protection, including efficiency improvement, diversification of the renewable energy portfolio, virtual water trade, and enhanced use of groundwater resources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I had I, I just see a, a, a chat message um, popping up. Um, we'll make the um, the recording available on our YouTube channel. Um, there was a question about the availability of your slides and and the recording. The, re the recording will be made available. Um, in the coming days or so on our YouTube channel. Um, please take the opportunity to ask Dr. Um, Kayul questions in the Q&A box. I will start off the um, discussion um, by asking some initial questions. So Tahir, thank you very, very much for this uh, amazing overview of all the work that you're doing at IASA. And um, uh, maybe to, to start off, uh, um, um, with a reference to the amazing background that you have there. Um, that, that is the summer palace of the uh, imperial family in, 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 in Austria about um, um, whom they used to make films. Um, I actually had the privilege of, of visiting um, your institute before I came here to, uh, to, to, to Canada. It's an, it's an amazing um, place to, to, to visit. It's also a very unique institute um, where you are working, um, supported by so many uh, different countries and, and, um, and, and you've got some really interesting work going on there that is, that is overlapping with the kind of work that we do here in, in, in Waterloo. So aging population and aging is a, is, a, is a major focus here as well, as well as water, uh, the, the, the work that you're doing. Um, so having said that, um, I, I, I just wanted to ask you a few um, kickoff questions about um, um, more generally, maybe, how, how do you um, uh, bring different disciplines that, that clearly contribute to all the work that you presented um, together? How do, how do you 
How do you facilitate that? So this is work that your group is doing, um, but no doubt there is there are maybe interlinkages with 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 other groups or um, um, other disciplines. And I was also interested a little bit in in hearing maybe a little bit more of how you organize the interaction with with the stakeholders. You were also referring to to, to that. Would you be able to give us a little bit more background, perhaps on 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 those collaborations? Yes, thank you very much. So yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, it is a challenging task uh, to uh, bring different disciplines uh, together, basically because um, all of us, we, we talk different languages. We have different kind of understanding of the, of the water of the water issues, for example, a different uh, hydrologist has a different understanding than economists. So the, I think the first step is to try to understand uh, each other uh, and then to, um, to find ways to, to communicate. I think communication is the, the important step. The first important step is that to find a way to communicate and to understand each other. Um, so that's the first step. The second step to me, from my experience is uh, there are different spatial and temporal resolutions that we deal with. Uh, hydrologists, they look more into daily, daily grid, grid scale resolution, while economists, we, we look mostly at more like administrative, regional, country level, studies and also the temporal scale are different. So we need to find a way how to, to bridge and how to bring those scales to a common scale where all of us could work. And I think this Zambezi study, we, we find a way. So we could do the simulation, the hydrological and land use simulation at the grid scale, then build tools to, uh, to aggregate or to upscale this information into a scale where, where we doing optimization and hydroeconomic modeling can use. Um, that, that's the, the thing. In terms of, of stakeholders, again, it's also very demanding, uh, very demanding task. We have been developing also tools to communicate with stakeholders, for example, so-called simulation, simulation games. Um, we have been in different workshops. It's time consuming. Sometimes the, the information you get from those workshops are a little bit difficult to translate into model inputs, require extra effort, but I think it pays, it pays off at the end. So, yeah. Do you, do you, just a very quick follow up, and there, there is a question already in the Q&A box, and I'll get to that in a second. So just to follow up on that, so do you also share your, your results then again? Is there a feedback loop again? You talk with the stakeholders, you try to integrate that into the modeling, and then you also share the results with them? Yes. So the first, the first thing we did was to, to go there, talk to the stakeholders, understand the challenges, show them the models we have, how the models could deal with those challenges, get their inputs, go back home, translate the information we got into the quantitative inputs that we can introduce into the model and simulate. Then we got the first draft of the results. Then we went back again to the study area, showed the result, got feedback. This is reasonable, this is not reasonable. And then we adjusted and then we, we could finalize. And I guess the stakeholder experts, they always recommend an iterative process where you, you basically you know, try to, to exchange with stakeholders several times, not only one time. And it should be also, we should learn from each other. Uh, it's not modular teaching stakeholders, but we should learn from each other and interact in both ways. Thank you. Thank you, Tahir. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to move to the Q&A box. So we have a question from Narisiman, um, and, and he's asking, could you please comment if reuse of treated wastewater can help us 
to meet some of the increasing demands. What are your thoughts on water reuse to improve water security? Yeah, my response would be definitely yes, <laughs> because uh, given the, gr the, the growth of, of population and um, the urbanization rates, there will be a lot of wastewater available. And if this wastewater is properly collected, treated, and reused, it will solve a lot of our current problems. Uh, now, I think the, the main issue with the reuse is the, not the technology, but more like the um, acceptability, how people would accept to, to irrigate with wastewater. And so there, I guess there, there, is a, there, is a need, there is a need for incentives to incentivize uh, users and farmers to substitute fresh water with uh, treated water. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there is a, they, they call it, I believe, the uh, yuck factor in the, in the social sciences literature, um, studies that look at uh, public perception and but also from farmers maybe um, when applying wastewater to, 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 their, to their land. Thank you so much. Um, there is another question um, in, in the Q&A. Can you comment on how your work integrates non-economic goals, such percentage of the population with safe drinking water, protecting habitat of threatened or endangered species, or irrigating a certain amount of land with food staples where food security is weak? Sure, this is a very good question. Um, I guess what, what, we, what we do is we have an, at least from the hydroeconomic modeling side, we have usually an objective function, which is an economic objective function, let's say benefits or costs that you want to either maximize or minimize. And then you have a number of constraints. And what we do usually is to, to, to introduce constraints. For instance, if we want to, to uh, work with environmental flow, we, we introduce a constraint that enforces environmental flow at certain river reaches. Um, if we want food security, um, const like certain crops to be irrigated for food security reason, although they may not economically make sense, so we could also force that through constraints. Thank you. So we have another question. So it's from an anonymous attendee. So I, I, I don't know who, who is behind the questions, but another very good question. Can you comment on how hydroeconomic simulation models can help optimize solutions? In other words, how do you move from the results of the various simulations to identifying the economically best system operation? Yeah, I guess most hydroeconomic models are, are optimization models. They, they, they optimize an objective function. As I said, it could be uh, the economic benefits from irrigated agriculture. So what those models can do is to, to find the solution that maximizes the benefit subject to a number of, of constraints. So, to my knowledge, I mean, I, I know that there are some hydroeconomic model, they probably called hydroeconomic model, but they do simulations, but most hydroeconomic model should include an object, an economic objective function to find the least cost optimal solution. Yeah. So I, I was wondering also a little bit about this, about this economic model. Um, um, how, how, do you account for indirect effect? Is, is, it, is it a partial equilibrium model or is it a computer general equilibrium model? Um, no, it is, it is a partial equilibrium uh, where we are looking at the benefit of, of one sector. Uh, we, don't, we didn't look at the indirect uh, effect, but recently we have um, yeah, published a paper where we uh, linked an input output uh, table model with the hydroeconomic model. So in order to look at uh, not only the direct effect, but also the indirect effect on other sectors and in other regions of the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe just also to follow up on the question about these non-economic goals. So what I noticed is that in your presentation, you, you, you use GDP as an indicator also for um, in institutional capacity. And we we, we know that you know we know the importance of, of water governance 
Um, do, do you have any plans um, to, to maybe extend the framework that you're using or the, 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 the indicators that you're using to, to measure institutional capacity or institutional strength? Yes, so that, that's also a very good uh, comment from uh, because uh, when we, we have been working on this hydroeconomic classification, uh, we tried several indicators. Uh, some of the indicators, they were not well received by the stakeholders. So for instance, um, corruption index, that was not well received by stakeholders and they didn't want it to be included. While other indicators, if you take the human development index, for instance, it correlates with GDP. Uh, so the problem was like, um, there, there were a problem of correlation between the indicators. So the GDP at the end was, we, we found was the best indicator, but of course, it's not the only indicator to, to, uh, to, to represent what a governance. And in an in in ongoing project we have now with the World Bank, we are looking at what they call the water security diagnostic framework, which includes different components. Uh, so economic component, physical component, and also a governance component. And then we started now collecting several indicators to show the, to, to, to look at the governance aspects, including uh, what we call qualitative indicators, so newly, newly developed, totally newly developed indicators to look at governance, um, governance aspects. And I hope this work will be released within the next few months. Okay, that sounds very good. It reminds me a little bit of the uh, Blue Peace Index that The Economist has developed as well. You may, may have heard of it, but for, for, for these transboundary uh, river basins, and you got a number of those in, in, in your, in your, in your um, model as well. So that sounds very interesting um, to, to uh, hear. Can, can I maybe just um, follow, follow up um, also on, on something else that, that I found very intriguing is in, in one of your frameworks at the beginning, you, you also made a link between uh, adaptation and mitigation. Are, are you able to talk a little bit more about that? How, how that, how that connection is made in your models? Yes. Um, so the, uh, the, um, for example, one, one study that we did um, also a few years ago was to look at how um, the adaptation to both climate and socioeconomic changes will, um, will um, interact with mitigation. So basically, when, when you try to implement mitigation options, most many of them will lead to increasing water demand. And this, um, of course, will create problems when, when you have growing population and, and incomes, and the demand for water is, is, is increasing into the future. So that's, that's one, one way to look at it, the trade-off between climate mitigation and adaptation. And the other way is, of course, these different scenarios. So we have been simulating different RCPs and SSPs, and the different RCPs, this so-called radio, um, um, so the climate climate scenarios, they they come with different mitigation levels, and they are also linked to the to the SSPs. Okay. Thank you. So I, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to ask you one, one last question, and then, and then I think we can um, um, wrap, wrap up the, the, the water talk. So I'm, 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 I'm just generally um, curious, curious to, to hear um, a, a little bit more from you um, about what you just referred to as well. So you have these supply management um, interventions. So you talk about technology. Uh, that you can introduce in, in irrigated agriculture, for example, to, to save uh, water. Um, you also talk about uh, demand management, and, and that seems to focus uh, to a large extent on, on the need then also perhaps to reduce production volumes or, or consumption volumes. Uh, can, I, can I ask you just, how, is, is water pricing uh, as, as, a, as a water uh, demand management tool also part of the uh, um, model instrument that you that you have are like water markets or water pricing are they are they incorporated in your models 
Uh, yes, they can be incorporated, and we have done several analysis of, uh, for instance, uh, how water could be different ways to allocate water between uses. So, for example, if we have um, uh, water markets, so water is allocated to to high value uses compared to other uh, allocation uh, mechanisms, for example, proportional sharing of water between users or upstream downstream priorities. <clears throat> so th those type of instrument can be analyzed and we, we have did some, we did some, some analysis. Also the pricing, different pricing level, different, um, different options uh, of pricing also can, can be analyzed and we, we did some, some analysis of all the implication of those instruments. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tahir. Um, I'm, I propose we 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 wrap it up. Um, um, there are no more questions in the Q and A. Thank you so much for this wonderful overview of of the work that goes on in in that amazing building behind you. I cannot stop looking at it. Um, I very much um, hope that we get the opportunity to um, exchange more um, of the work that that we're doing. On both sides of the um, of, of the Atlantic, I, I want to thank you once again. If you would have been here in person, um, you would have gotten a, a big round of applause. Thank you very very much for uh, your time and um, and and um, for presenting the work of your of your group once again. Um, to those of you who participated today, thank you very much for attending this last water talk of the year 2021. We'll be back with you. Um, in more than a month, you'll have to wait till Thursday, the 20th of January, when we will have our next water talk, and we'll have Professor Amy Pruden from Virginia Tech um, and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering um, give the next water talk. Um, to everyone, stay healthy, stay safe, um, have a great holiday break in, in the weeks to come, and we look forward to welcoming you again to the next water talk. Um, on the 20th of, of January. Tahir, thank you very much once again. And, and thank you all thank you. For, um, for, for attending this water talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.